<laughs> hello. Hello, David. It's it's wonderful to see you. Thank you very much for coming on to our show tonight as a guest. We've had several people ask and get David Curtin on, and I thought that <laughs> this was a good week to bring you on because you've been very busy on social media as well. So just uh, by way of introduction, for those folk who don't know, I just want to read the first paragraph from your Heritage Party website, which says, quote, For far too long, the United Kingdom has been led down a path of managed decline by successive governments, and the current government is ruining our society, culture and economy. We are a great nation and we deserve better. We have a glorious history and a wonderful heritage which has been given to us by our forefathers, which we should enjoy and build upon to pass on to our children and grandchildren. Well, three cheers for that. And I don't think you'll see that paragraph on any other party political website, quite, <laughs> no. quite frankly. So please tell us um, what inspired you to set up the Heritage Party to promote that particular message. Yeah, thanks, Alistair. Well, thanks for having me on the show, first of all. But um, yeah, I wrote that about three years ago, actually, because I set the Heritage Party up in 2020. And at the time, there was nothing in the sort of space that I was in. So I was elected onto the London Assembly in 2016. So you and people watching might have seen me over many, many years questioning Sadiq Khan in London. There's a lot to question there because he does a lot of very dubious things. Um, but, you know, I was in another political party before I set up the Heritage Heritage Party, but there was nothing really in the sort of Brexit space that at, at that time, you know, the Brexit Party had deactivated, there was nothing else going on. So I thought we need a socially conservative party in the UK. And there isn't one because the Conservatives have got the name, but they're fake. They're not real Conservatives. In fact, in many cases, in many ways, they're anti-Conservative. They're not um, protecting and conserving our heritage and our nation and the fabric of society, they are running it down. Um, you, for example, and one thing that I really, uh, I, it concerns me and I've been campaigning against for a long time is this relationships and sexuality education in whatever form it is going into schools across the nation. They actually implemented it in England, just like the SNP implemented it in Scotland and Labour implemented it in Wales. And so, you know, that's just one example of where the Conservatives are not Conservative and the whole of the political sphere, the Westminster parties are basically one uniparty they're just doing the same thing they've coalesced and there may be small differences between some of them but they're all uh pushing the woke agenda the the uh, climate agenda they all supported lockdowns and all that kind of stuff and we need something that is going to stand all against against all of those things and our strap line our motto if you like is freedom family nation which summarizes what we're for uh you know in three words so i set the heritage party up to be a socially conservative party with positive principles that we would stick to consistently which i think the nation needs to get back to to restore what we were uh, and the wonderful heritage that has been left by our to us from our forefathers but which has been systematically broken down over many decades Absolutely. And you mentioned that in 2020, and that was such a, a revolutionary year, mm. uh, revolutionary against Britain in many ways, because uh, not only were we locked down, uh, which which went against our national tradition of freedom of movement, but those of us who spoke up against government policy often found ourselves silenced. And in fact, there was government uh, and there still is government offices running to to shut people down who don't go along with the with the trends, and there was also, of course, the whole, um, I, for want of a better expression, the BLM thing, uh, which was yeah. anti, literally anti heritage, mm. um, anti uh, British history, or yeah. certainly misrepresenting British history, put it that way. Mm. So it was it was good to see you largely alone really in many ways 
um, fighting back against that. You you mentioned there that the we have a uni party in charge. Have you ever uh, figured out how that uni party has come about? Uh, you know why should it have have gone like that? That we've got two parties who are so similar. I think they're all signed up to the various different agendas which are coming from globalist bodies which set themselves up above nation states. You know, obviously, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, and so on, and the Bank of International Settlements with what they want to do. So, you know, the UN has got Agenda 2030 and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, that's pushing all of the climate alarmism that they want to dismantle our energy infrastructure. So you see every single party is totally beholden to this uh, climate emergency as they call it there is no climate emergency because carbon dioxide is not harmful but they signed up to this you know the the um sexuality education is part of that the world health organization is pushing that as well and they have a grid uh of um outcomes and and uh, things that they want to teach children on and it's absolutely disgusting and you, that's why you see materials going into schools which teach children about self-pleasure that to put it in the the mildest form possible to four and five year olds you know which is absolutely appalling and then you've got obviously the world economic forum is pushing the you will own nothing and be happy agenda um and so you know so uh essentially to, to take away private property and also you're pushing uh the everything that happened in the lockdown period and the covid period with these experimental injections going on which comes back to what you said at the beginning is that you know 2020 was a terrible year and all of the parties in Westminster, all of the MPs together voted for the Coronavirus Act. Not a single one voted against it, even though they said uh, some of them beat their breasts and said oh, how terrible it was. But they voted for it anyway. And then there was the propaganda coming from the uh, behavioral psychology units that were called people like me and you and anyone who stood against it as um, COVID idiots and granny killers and uh, vaccine refugees use nicks and all of these new words they made up to smear people conspiracy theorists and so on and and this is what i got called uh from almost everybody all over the place because actually at the beginning in 2020 i think i was the only elected politician at all who uh you know <laughs> opposed lockdowns and opposed the injections on the basis that there is no long term safety data. Uh, you know, with my scientific background, I can tell you, you know, every single medicine and drug and pharmaceutical that comes onto the market needs to go through rigorous safety and efficacy testing for about 10 years before it's, it gets anywhere near the market. But this was just dosed into people after three months. I mean, there's clearly you just don't do that. But everybody did it anyway and then tried to smear and discredit anyone who stuck to the normal procedure of needing long term safety data. Um, yes. It was very obvious to me that they were all in it together and they're all pushing things that are being done to harm people. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's absolutely appalling and we need to speak up against it. Yes. Do you see um, this agenda as being a, a deliberately well, you sort of alluded to it there as a, as a deliberately harmful one, or do you see it as simply something that is just a load of people who don't really know what they're doing and they're just mucking up and there might be some bad consequences, but they don't really realise it? Or do you think, no, there's actually a, you know, a militant evil... Uh Force. I think there's different yeah. levels. There's different levels of people. I do think it is a planned agenda. The people right at the top who are pushing it, they know what's going on. And um, yeah, the, the 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 idea is, you know, this is a plan that's been going on for a long time. Um, and there are different aspects of it. I feel like I'm fighting 20 different battles at the same time. But it is ultimately to um get rid of nation states, get rid of families, get rid of private property. Those are the three things which are in the Communist Manifesto from Karl Marx in 1848. So it's essentially the implementation of, of communism um, in, in sort of ideologically. But there's, there's much more added to it now with the technology that we've got and, you know, with the technocracy that will run uh, a, a one world 
system, a government system with AI, you know, added on top of what was there 150 years ago. So there are some people who actively want to do this. They want to cause chaos in order to impoverish people, um, destroy small businesses, destroy livelihoods, and take away people's property through financial crises. And then also the regulations which are coming in to do with climate and buildings uh, having to adhere to new climate regulations and, and have a certain energy rating. And if your house or home doesn't um, adhere to those new regulations, then you won't be able to sell it or rent it and, and eventually live in it. So, you know, that's just another aspect of the uh, many, many different things coming against us. But sorry, within that, there are there's a whole you know, class of useful idiots who think that it's a good thing, you know, who actually genuinely believed that because they were lied to and deceived sadly very easily to think that everybody needed a covid injection to um uh, to protect them against covid which is nonsense and that mass immigration is a good thing and if you're against that then you're racist and then we also need to save the planet so we need to stop using our cars you know, and all these different things so th there's a lot of people who are brainwashed so easily and that is, that is the disturbing thing is that how can a nation which is, is such a great history have a whole you know the majority of society is so easily going along with all the propaganda which is put into their heads it's it's quite frightening um but yes but there's also people making money out of it too you know which is a whole other thing <laughs> yes yes that's right yes um well you ask how can people go along with it it's i i think we're entering a stage where people have people's brains have not yet caught up with the ability to handle the barrage of mm. information that we're subjected to, because we're not really meant as human beings to to um, be subjected to all of these images and all mm. of these problems and all of these choices and all of these sorts of things. We're really just meant to take the day as it comes and very quietly just, mm. um, you know, live in the woods and hunt rabbits <coughs> and stuff like that. We're not meant to suddenly be worrying about what's happening in the other side of the world or having an opinion on it or then trying to understand um, whether a, vac a vaccine is good or bad or for you. It's like too much information. Most mm -hmm. people can't handle it. And so the, it, the natural default position for so many people, uh, understandably, is just to say, well, that, that group look like they know what they're talking about or mm -hmm. I, f I favor the way that guy looks over what the way that that other party politician mm -hmm. looks like so i'm just going to go with what they say and that's just a natural kind of default but that means that so many of us can get taken along with stuff and we're seeing that all uh, all of these things uh, covid and all of the wars that have happened and that are happening and so on people forced to uh, go along with things and make make um choices that very often they're just following somebody else's agenda really mm. um th that's the bad thing you mentioned of course you said that you had a a, a background in chemistry you used to be a chemi uh, chemistry teacher yeah. is that correct yeah that's right for nearly 20 years i was a chemistry teacher up to a level and ib diploma level here and also abroad as well so i mean that's been fantastic and uh, it does and give you, me that. you went to st andrews university right, I did. I did. Yeah. I loved it. I had a wonderful time at St. Andrews for four years. Yet yeah, when I was young, I'd say, yeah, that was my university. What, why did you pick St. Andrews? Because most, um, most people, if, I suppose you were living in England at the time, they just pick the nearest university to them. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, it just looked amazing and it looked so nice. And uh, there's so much history, so much tradition. You know, it, it, you don't really know everything about every university in the country. You just do your research, look at, look at things. But it, it was very good, you know, a university for science and, and everything. And, um, you know, I was delighted to be offered a place, you know, being Scotland's oldest university and the, the third oldest university in the country I, I guess I was drawn to the place having a lot of history and um, you know a lot of heritage and, and being a beautiful beautiful city well well there you go it would be that part of you that that values the the historical past you know you saw St Andrews as you just said there as, as something with the, the heritage that there'd be that perhaps that you were subconsciously drawn to mm. 
Uh, Paul sent a question in here. It says, David, can you shed any light on the shocking event of an elections hustings at which you were going to speak in Lewisham being shut down by extremists? What excuses did the police office offer? That was a long time ago. That was June 2018. So that was over right. five years ago now. Um, yeah, I was going into a hustings. The Labour and the Tory candidate didn't turn up. Um, there was another party there called For Britain. And the, the police made the excuse that they were far right extremists and they were coming to disrupt the meeting. But they, they didn't even turn up at the meeting. But there was actually a huge crowd of stand up to racism people, which is an arm's length Labour Party organization. And they, they were intimidating everybody going in. Um, yeah, and I was shouted at and nearly spat on uh, as I went in. But I mean, I'm a big guy, so I wasn't too intimidated by it. But a lot of other people in the audience, you know, were. Um, who, you know, obviously who, who is not as big as I am. So, and then after 20 minutes, you know, the, the candidates gave the speeches and the police decided to close the meeting. I mean, never heard anything like that in my life. This was a hustings for an election and there was a, a, a crowd of far left outside agitating, causing all kinds of problems, acting like they were going to have a riot and storm the meeting and the police close it down. And, um, you know, I asked Sadiq Khan about it later on in the London Assembly, and he just read some statement out which was full of untruths about the event. You know, basically, you know, it was just uh, complete rubbish that they said. They just made up an excuse and blamed, oh, it was the far right. You know, the far right were going to turn up, which is absolute nonsense. Um, oh, yeah. They were going to turn up, but never turned up. But the ones that turned up and actually did turn up they stopped it mm. it was like the <laughs> yeah yeah crazy yeah crazy. Right. yeah yeah good well do you have um plans for next year's general election um it's a heritage mm. party planning to stand in it we i want to stand in as many places as we possibly can so i'm t i'm taking on candidates i'm interviewing candidates we have we have some we have in in many places around the country obviously there's new constituencies going to be in place for the next general election because they're changing the boundaries but um yeah we we will just work and we'll stand as many people as we can um with as whatever we can do so you know where we will just uh I have a long-term vision, you know, so there'll be the local elections this year, the, the coming up in May 2024, the general election, but we um, we just need to, to we're here for the long term, so um, we will we will just do whatever we can. Good, good, good. Um, what I like, what I liked when I was reading through the Heritage Party website is that you seem to be working from fundamental principles on all of your matters so that means that you don't get blown by the winds mm. of outrageous fortune or whatever happens to be the the thing of the day and i was you made a tweet back on the 22nd of october you said quote right-wing commentators have for years upheld the right to free speech for everyone even if that speech is offensive to some we should continue to uphold free speech for everyone, including both pro-Israeli and pro-Palestinian rallies. And I thought, well, I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see that somebody else thinks the same as I do, because I had been shocked by some right wing, as you say, commentators who love to talk about freedom of speech and how it's so bad that they get cancelled. Mm -hmm. And then... There's some pro-Palestinian demo, and they're the first people to jump up and say, this is outrageous, this shouldn't be happening. Arrest these people, send them home. <laughs> you know, yeah. what, was that, was that, uh, what, what made you... No, absolutely. I, I, I'm exactly the same. I, I found found that very disturbing that you had some people people I know, um, you know, in the right wing commentary at space who have been free speech, free speech, free speech. Our free speech has been taken away. We need free speech. We stand up for this. And then this happens. And suddenly, where's free speech? It's gone. You know, people should not be allowed to say this word or that word or this march should be closed down. And I know within the march, there were some individuals doing things which are very unsavory and perhaps going beyond, you know, the 
bounds of free speech and inciting violence. And that's absolutely right that they should be um, arrested as individuals and charged as individuals. But, you know, to actually say this rally must not happen because we don't agree with it. Once you go down that road, then the other side can say to us, well, you shouldn't be allowed to have your rally or do your things. And what has happened already in law is that the left have made it a criminal offence to pray and protest outside abortion centres, you know, and everyone, I think, on the right wing would agree that that is, you know, a, a blatant attack on free speech. It shouldn't have happened. Not even Germany has done that. They still allow that to happen. Um, but when mm. we, we, we need to uphold the principle and we always say, even if it's offensive to some people, you should be able to say it, you know, I mean, mm. you, you don't be abusive. You don't harass people. You don't incite violence or glorify terrorism, of course. But you should be allowed to express your opinion or support for something without being closed down. You know, I mean, so, yeah, so that's why I put that tweet out. Yeah, absolutely. And you you make the good point there about about um, praying as well and how that's just going to be used against us. I saw some people saying... You know, you know how you see these pictures of of, of all these Muslims that are always down on their knees praying, and people, some people don't like that. And I'd rather there wasn't a huge, huge population of of um, non Christians. But you can't say that they can't pray. Obviously, yeah. they can pray. You know, unless yeah. you're gonna, if you're gonna say no, no praying, then who's the first people who are gonna get hit by that? Yeah, Christians. Exactly. I mean, I, yeah. I do think, you know, that where, where there was the mass prayer in Whitehall, I don't agree with that because they closed down the public highway, you know, so I mean, oh, that's right. another issue. But you know, if they want to go and pray in the park, yeah, okay, they can go and pray in the park. Um, you know, they're not hurting anybody. But, you know, the other issue and the, the other side of that is I don't agree with mass rapid immigration, which has happened uh, over 30 or so years of Labour and Tory. So we've got the issue. That's another issue that needs to be dealt with. But, you know, if people are here, they should have the, the freedom to speak and to express themselves, provided that they're not, you know, doing anything which is breaking the law. Yes. And we've always had those laws in the sense that you can't incite to a crime. Mm. Um, that is, you can't incite to violence or incite to arson or incite to any other crime, because that is a crime in itself. You're encouraging yeah. people to commit a crime. But if you're just saying unsavory language that some people have a different opinion about, mm. then that's uh, a different matter entirely. But mm. they, they, they came up with this clever concept of hate speech, which people uh. like yourselves, no doubt, always campaigned against, because you could see how, how that could easily just be drawn into how is it any... Defined? Yeah. How is it defined? It's speech that I don't like is essentially yeah, what it comes exactly. down to. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I also want to raise uh, the matter with you. I saw a really, really good video that you did because you you you're basically doing almost like a video a day these days. Um, <laughs> right, I'm trying. Yeah, <laughs> really. That, that's that requires a lot of effort. But anyway, you yeah. did you did one the other day, and I would really encourage people to to watch this because it's very unusual. And you spoke about the concept of Judeo Christian. And I know mm. that the Heritage Party is an overtly Christian party. And you were pointing out that this phrase never existed un, uh, really in any way prior to 1935. Right. And in fact, it is a misleading phrase mm. um, because it gives the impression that these are two equivalent religions that are com almost compatible with each other in a yeah. sense. Um, would you like to just explain, we'll, we'll put the link up in our threads for mm. that video so other people can see it, but it, I found it very illuminating. What was the, the thinking behind you coming out yeah, with that? Yeah, I mean, it, this is a phrase which is almost ubiquitous at the moment, and people hear it and they don't even think about the phrase. It's like a propaganda phrase. It was actually um, promoted in the 1930s and 1940s to bring common cause between Jews and Christians, mostly in America, against National Socialism, against Hitler and everybody. And obviously it, it, um, it sort of caught on in, in Europe as well, and then it stayed with us. But it, it was never used at all uh, before the 1930s. It, it was some a couple of people randomly used the phrase, you know, here and there, but not to mean, you know, that, that Jews and Christians had some common culture, common history, common heritage, because before then, the two religions were seen as completely distinct. 
um, you know, evolving after Jesus, obviously Christians accept that Jesus is the Messiah. He died and rose again. And then we have the New Testament. Um, the Jews then didn't accept Jesus. They had the Babylonian Talmud was written in the second to fourth century, which says horrible things about Jesus. And then later on, there's the Kabbalah was developed in the 13th century, actually in France. Um, so it's a completely distinct religion with its own books. And yet may, some some Jews will, yeah, obviously will respect the Old Testament as well. Um, but some you have Talmudic Jews and Kabbalistic Jews as well, who, who put an emphasis on those other two, two books. And so this is really something I just wanted to bring into the conversation to highlight, because at the moment with the situation going on in Israel, Palestine, everybody is being manipulated to support one side or the other. And I completely understand Jews supporting Israel. I completely understand Arabs supporting Palestine. But it's so strange when Anglo-Saxons and German people and Scandinavians and Slavic people have, have been programmed to have a visceral emotional support or reaction for one side or the other. It doesn't make any sense. But I think it, especially... Christians, uh, Protestant Christians in, in America particularly, but also um, in Europe and other places uh, where it was, Protestantism is strong, um, have been uh, programmed with phrases like this, this, this concept of Judeo-Christian. We have a Judeo-Christian heritage and culture. Therefore, you must support Israel over Palestine. Uh, and that is a this is not actually what should be the case this is not how you know this is not has no historical um foundation before 1930 the 1930s and 1940s so i think this is just something i wanted to bring to people's attention so they could think about it yes i i'm glad that you did because i had been mystified by uh looking at twitter and seeing americans in particular um who were almost psychopathically uh, opposed to the Palestinians and were openly calling for basically genocide. And then you go on to this person's yeah. account and he calls himself a Christian. Yeah, I'm like, what? Well, well, that, that makes no sense because as you pointed out in that video, there's a lot of Christians in Gaza. Right. Um, um, there's all the Arab Christians that we always forget mm. about. And I think we forget about them because we're made to not to think that it's just like European Christians and uh, Jews in the Middle East. Yeah. And in that phrase, Judeo-Christianity, that's what it tends to make us think without us realizing there's all these Arab Christians as well who are all caught up in the conflict and oh. we're forgetting about them. Yeah, and they, they've got their opinions as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's about five times as many Palestinian Christians as there are um, Israeli Christians, Messianic Jews. Yeah, there's about mm. 30,000 Messianic Jews, as I understand, mm. living in Israel, which is fantastic. But 150 to 200,000 Palestinian Christians, mostly in the West Bank, not that many in Gaza, but the number is going down. I think there's only a thousand or so left. But the third oldest church in the world, St. Porphyrius Church, I think, is in Gaza and was mm -hmm. recently bombed in a, you know, a, a building the belonging to the church was bombed mm. recently mm. by the Israeli Defense Force and killing a lot of Christians who were, you know, uh, seeking shelter there. So, you know, we need to realize that, that there's many, many Arab Christians who, who get completely canceled, if you like. It's almost as though their existence is not mentioned, as people don't want to even acknowledge that they exist. But, you know, it, before um, 9 11 and the war on terror, there were yeah, tens of thousands of, 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 sorry, millions of Arab Christians, particularly in Syria and Iraq, living very happily. Lebanon was once a majority Christian country. Um, it's changed now because of massive immigration into Lebanon. But yeah, and also in, in Palestine, in, in Egypt, um, mm -hmm. there's 20% of Egypt are Coptic Christians. So there's huge numbers. And, and my main concern for the Middle East is that, you know, as a Christian, obviously, is my, my Christian, Christian brethren will yes. have the freedom to worship freely and to be able to share the gospel uh, freely. You know, that's my main concern for the Middle East. Fantastic. Well, do you know what? I'm so thankful that you are doing what you're doing, David, because you are at the moment, you're fairly a lone voice 
in in that effort, but a, a powerful one and a very sincere one. So thank you for everything that you do in that regard. And I do encourage people to check out heritageparty.org. And also, um, David is on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash David Curtin. And for people listening on our podcast, Curtin is K-U-R-T-E-N. And you've also got, I think, is your personal um, website where you put up your videos, which is davidcurtin.net. And they're, they're worth checking out. Um, David, that's a half hour went very, very quickly. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'd love to have you back on again sometime. No doubt there'll be plenty more to speak about. All I can say at the moment is thanks again. And uh, Godspeed, God bless you and your fantastic work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, David. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good to be with you. Cheers. <laughs> Bye now.